Oh, my. <laughs> okay, we will call the Rules Committee to order. It is 1.02. So uh, this time uh, I'd have uh, Councillor Crittenden, you want to bless the meeting? help us go through this council meeting that you've that your path led us all here at these tables father and I'm thankful for that and just help us to, uh, to do the right work and and we'll know in our heart that that it is the right work and we just again I'm, I'm always thankful to you and uh, don't deserve a lot of what you give me but uh, just go with us now and thank you most of all for for Jesus, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Counselor. Roll call, Shelley. Yes, sir. Joe Bird. Honey. Kanan Duncan. Honey. Keith Austin. Here. Harley Buzzard. Here. Julia Coates. Here. Sean Crittenden. Here. Joe Deer. Here. Mike Dobbins. Here. Rex Jordan. Here. Daryl Legg. Here. Wes No Fire. Here. Dora Petskowski. Here. Mike Shambaugh. Here. Mary Baker Shaw. E.O. Smith. Here. Janice Taylor. Here. Victoria Vesquez. We have a quorum. Okay. Council members, I uh, want to let you know when you make a motion or second, make sure you turn your mic on so it can be recorded. Okay? So with that, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Got Perfect. a motion? Second. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, the ayes have it. Reports. Marshal Service, Shannon Buell. Yes, Councilor Buzzard. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could, just before Marshal Buell gives his report, I just want to thank all the uh, Tribal Council members and people that said a prayer for my wife, Cynthia. She had a, what we call a brain bleed uh, last Sunday evening. And I just wanted to let everybody know that she's at home. She's doing okay. Uh, we're going to go back in uh, four weeks to get another scan to see what went on. We don't really know what happened right now. It's just one of those things. Uh, Cynthia is one of those persons that uh, had always been healthy, uh, ran, walked, and always is energetic. And uh, this just came on all of a sudden. And so we don't really know what happened right now. And, uh, and we just want to thank uh, everybody for their prayers and thinking about her during this time. So I just wanted to let, uh, let the council members know that uh, she's doing okay. Uh, she's at home. And we we'll go back in four weeks, and I think right now she's only taking the medication to, to prevent seizures. So that's one of the uh, things that could happen, that you could have a seizure with this uh, type of uh, injury. And um, the other thing is, uh, other than that, she's doing pretty good. She has a little sight vision, peripheral vision in her eyes. But other than that, uh, you know, she's in good spirits and is doing okay. But thank yeah. you for your time. That's good to hear. <clears throat> also, I'd like to... Uh, I'd like to thank Rob Darty, Homney, Lil Dave, Gail, Viola Glass, Doris, and Charlie Shell for that wonderful meal we had. You know, that's uh, we don't do that very often, but it was just good to have a different taste of a meal there. And I want to thank uh, Gail for putting it together. So let's give them a nice applause for taking care of us. Okay, uh, Marshal Buell, you're up. Good afternoon. Uh, be, besides the uh, rules document that we sent in, uh, one of the things I, I want to be uh, at least transparent with the council here and the people that have uh, put in to try to be elected for council, uh, that we will look at any uh, accusation of, of illegal acts from any person in the council, but we have to have them substantiated. Uh, we will not send marshals out to look at candidates on rumor or innuendo or thoughts. We, we need some, some hard stuff and we'll be polite. Those of you in this room that have had us talk to you over the years, uh, we, we're non-biased. We're, we're, non we're here to protect the process as much as we can in my department. Uh, those of you who know me uh, know that I don't campaign for any uh, council member nor chief or any elected official of the nation. I believe in my position, we have to have that standoff. But we'll be fair uh, and impartial to anything we do. We're not after anyone. 
but we do want this to be uh, as safe an election process as, as humanly possible. And we talk about this at every election, so this isn't a different one uh, this time. But I just want to let you know that we're here for all the candidates that are running for tribal office, irrelevant on if you are a seated council person or you're trying to become a council person. We're here for that process. Other than that, is there any questions I can answer you as far as uh, my document? Any questions for our marshal? Yes, Councilor Buzzard. Yes, uh, Marshal Buell, uh, Buell, there seemed to be a, a breakdown in communication with our Delaware County officials up there. Is there anything that you can enlighten us to what happened there? I, I, can, I can talk as, as uh, a person that found out literally this weekend. We had uh, three individuals uh, in Delaware County Jail on homicide charges. Uh, they uh, it would be federal cases. The U.S. Attorney uh, for the Northern District, one of the AUSAs, called our office on uh, end of the week and asked if we could get a tribal warrant on, on an individual. The AG's office ramped up as fast as they could and got that warrant. We got that one held, but the U.S. Attorney that called didn't tell us that there were two other suspects being held on those, on those same accounts. The Delaware judge, in my opinion, uh, released the two other suspects Friday uh, by the order of Hogner. They had until March 31st before they had to release. This judge in Delaware County released, in my opinion, prematurely. We weren't notified that there were two other suspects in this case until Saturday. As soon as our office and the Attorney General's office found out on Saturday, we got the warrants as quick as we could, but they were already released on Friday. So that was a judge's order. Let me be very clear, it wasn't Delaware County Sheriff's Office, okay? They're, they're like we are. They got an order from the judge they had to release. Uh, that, that, that's my take on that. Uh, I can tell you we work well with the Delaware County Sheriff's Office and the DA's office up there. It was, quite frankly, in my opinion, a judge that prematurely released those two. I can tell you that we immediately got arrest warrants for them I've contacted the U.S. Marshal Service in Tulsa. They put the two individuals on their wanted list, and we have task force officers hunting them down as we speak. So, Okay, well, thank you for that information. It just seems like that, uh, and I don't know, this is my own opinion, it just seems like some of these officials, I'll put it like that, not saying who they are, but they want to make this known public as much as they can. They, I think they're spreading the word out that this is what's happening. And I don't know, maybe the public is entitled to know, but uh, it's kind of like this situation here. You know, there were just some miscommunications on it, I think, from their end. Sound to me like that uh, if we didn't know about the other two individuals, you know, what can we do to, 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 to do anything about it? So. Okay, well, I just wanted to hear what, what you said about it, and so I thank you for, for clearing that up. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, anybody else? <clears throat> the other counties, uh, they, they're, we have pretty good communications with them. Is that right? Yeah, we have communications good with all the counties, to include Delaware County. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you, I can't get in the mind of any person, let alone a, a, a state district judge. I don't know the ramp, the reasons why he released those two on Friday. I have no idea. i not even at purview to even ask him. Mm -hmm. uh, we just have to deal with the fallout on that. And I, I can assure you that we jumped on it as fast as we could, humanly possible. Uh, the tribal court uh, activated really fast to get those warrants to us, but they were already out of jail before we knew. Uh, we have tribal warrants, and... We're, we're hunting them. The, the federal agencies, the U.S. Marshals, are also uh, hunting them, and we will, we will bring them to justice. But okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Yes, Councilor Shambaugh. <clears throat> uh, Marshal Buell, um, because of this decision, a lot of people, um, judges, DAs, you know, they, they have their own ideas what's uh, going to happen. Uh, but in reality, uh, you know, I've had 
many, you know, several discussions with you in, in our AG's office, and um, our caseload has quadruple. I don't even know if that's good enough description of it. I mean, just to let everybody know here, know, everybody here know that uh, there's been a ton of people already screaming Hogner and, and McGurd and and they're filing all kinds of things to get out of jail or try to get out of trouble. And how, how many, um, about how many cases did we, have we inherited since that? Uh, of course, the Attorney General will be more apt to, to talk about the numbers, the exact numbers, because she gets those cases in. But I, it is my opinion that when the Cherokee courts were restarted after Ross v. Neff uh, decision 1990, I believe we are looking at more cases now than the history of the Cherokee Nation court system. That's how prolific the cases are coming to us. And you got to remember, it isn't even hard law yet until March 31st, so we still got four days. Once that hits, the rest of them are coming. This is a serious tidal wave of cases coming to the tribe. With that being said, I am very confident that our Attorney General's office is up to the task just like we are. I've looked at some of the hires uh, that the Attorney General's office has done preparing for this, and, and, and ladies and gentlemen, these are qualified, motivated young prosecutors, male and female. They can get the job done, I have confidence, and I'm not even in that department. I don't have anything to do with that department. I just see it on the outside, who they're looking at, who they're getting, who they're hiring. They're getting some of the best prosecutors that this tribe has ever seen, in, in, my, in my opinion. So we're on top of it as much as we can be. The benefit that we have here is the outstanding relationships over the past 22 years uh, with our state partners, whether it's at the municipal level, the county level, or the state level. Uh, with very ease, we got crossed up with Oklahoma Highway Patrol, something that was never considered a year ago or before then. It's those relationships that we build over years that when we ask, uh, they, they've stepped up. I'm very happy about that. I'm very happy that members of our community have stepped up to do this. Are, are, are there going to be some stumbling blocks along the way? Absolutely. Anything new? will have stumbling blocks. Uh, when I started here, I was never a cop. I came here with no idea what it was to be a police officer. And from the first day I was here, I only learned what it was to be an Indian cop. That is very different than any other law enforcement in the nation. I've now had almost 21 years, it'll be 21 in August, as my full-time job is being an Indian cop. More specifically, the Indian being first. There's laws, there's ways that you have to do business as an Indian police officer or the Indian criminal justice system that is different. All these agencies out here have good law enforcement men, men and women. I mean, absolutely outstanding. I think Eastern Oklahoma is fortunate above any other state of the quality and the motivation and the spirit of their law enforcement. They are lacking in what it is to be Indian, what, it, what, what this case means. I have staff right now in Sequoia County talking to law enforcement entities down there on the process. Now that it's at our front door, how do you do your job? How do you get up in the morning, go out and protect your people? And we've gone this all over. Uh, I, I talk on the phone with sheriffs, 12 times a day for the past week and a half. They have those same concerns. They have those same questions. We, and the Attorney General's office, uh, Chrissy Nemo, I think has probably run the, run the cell bill for the tribe up three times just because of the calls she gets from the DA's offices, the defense attorneys, prosecutors, you name it, uh, jail contracts, all these things that before we worried about Indian country, which was very small, quite frankly, compared to the state of Oklahoma. March 31, it's now all of it. It's our 14 counties 
within those historical boundaries is going to be Indian country. It is. And that's a new reality that we all have to look at. It's increased call volume, increased marshal presence, increased you name it. Uh, so I, I believe that we're staffing up as best as we can. I just sent to HR nine applicants. This will be the the largest mass hiring of deputy marshals since 2000. August of 2000, I think they hired on nine, uh, and we're going to hire on nine. I, I still have three openings. Uh, we reopened for three other positions. Uh, so th we're moving as fast as we can possibly move as a tribe to make sure that our community and our, our partners within the state are safe and secure. So. Well, thank you, sir. I, I just um, I'd like to thank you. You know, you've always been available when, you know, we've had questions and I, we, I have had questions because this is going to affect us, uh, well, all law enforcement greatly in in the Cherokee jurisdiction. So uh, you and the AG's office talked to Chrissy the other day about an issue we had, and um, there are some holes, um, and that's going to have to be figured out how to fill those holes. And those, those are going to be some tough, tough things to deal with, but um, I, I have all the confidence in the world that you guys, you know, I know you're doing your best, and um, but, man, um, you got your work cut out for you, and, and you, you should be in everybody's prayers. All uh, This whole thing should about this should be in everybody's prayers. So just thank you for, for what you guys have done to prepare us to cope with this when it happens. Well, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, good report. Thank you. <clears throat> Office of the Attorney General, Sarah Hill. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I'm just going to pick up where Shannon left off and talk some more about this exact same topic, uh, which is probably the, uh, the only topic to talk about with the Tribal Council today. Um, since our last um, you know, meeting, we've had the decision from the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals in the Hogner case, which I think I updated the Tribal Council on when it occurred. Um, Mr. Hogner was a felon in possession of a firearm in Craig County. He's a citizen of the Miami Nation, but of course the crime happened inside the Cherokee Nation Reservation. So he asked the court to um, dismiss his case. He was serving 50 years for being a felon in possession of a firearm, and um, the court dis has dismissed that. And I was going to share with you a couple of quotes, and that happened on March 11th, um, his crime occurred in October of 2015. But the district, the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals, which is the highest court in Oklahoma for criminal cases. So in Oklahoma, uh, they don't go to the Oklahoma Supreme Court. Criminal cases go to the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals. They found um, the district court, which was the, the lower court, appropriately applied McGirt to determine that Congress did establish a Cherokee reservation and that no evidence was presented showing that Congress explicitly erased or disestablished the boundaries of the Cherokee Reservation or that the state of Oklahoma had jurisdiction in this matter. And then it went on to say the state of Oklahoma did not have jurisdiction to prosecute appellant in this matter. So that was the decision of the district court. Uh, there were a couple of concurrences and uh, multiple concurrences to it, but that's the, that's the bottom line that the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals found, as we expected, that the Cherokee Reservation was established and had never been disestablished, making uh, Oklahoma's jurisdiction non-existent over people in Mr. Hogner's situation. I think it's worth taking just a minute to note the gravity of this decision um, for the Cherokee Nation. In 1970, Oklahoma didn't recognize tribal governments. They didn't recognize that the five tribes had any criminal jurisdiction inside their own boundaries. Um, it was a, a completely... Um, in the minds of the state of Oklahoma, there was, there was no Indian country left. There was no room for tribal governments. And it has been because of the work of tribal attorneys in the intervening years that the situation today is that not only do we have, you know, jurisdiction over our boundaries, but all of the five tribes have jurisdiction over their reservations, or they shortly will. 
And um, for people who are considering, I know the people have different feelings about lawyers. <laughs> um, but tribal lawyers are the reason why that we're, we, we went from where we were in 1970 to where we were today and it meant a lot of work by a lot of people over the years. And I especially wanted to note the contributions of Susan Work to the briefing that we did in Hogner. She was of great assistance to us and she's been uh, defending tribal sovereignty uh, along with a lot of other great tribal citizen attorneys for, for decades. So um, I think it's, it was worth taking a moment to acknowledge how far we've come in such a relatively short amount of time in, in the lifespan of, of, a, of a single person. Um, you, we've seen an entire change in how Cherokee Nation and how Indian tribes are viewed in Oklahoma. It's a big, big deal. Um, the Cherokee Nation, to get more to the details, have filed, uh, we filed over 375 new cases so far. I'm sure that's more cases already than have been filed in the last 10 years, uh, criminal cases that we filed in the last 10 years. Um, and my, you know, criminal prosecutors and their support staff are working diligently to ensure that we're very responsive to law enforcement, exactly like the circumstance um, which, you know, Marshall Buell described where we got a phone call from the U.S. Attorney's Office. They asked us to please, you know, get a, a information filed and a warrant out. We had it out that exact same day. Um, and that's the, the level of responsiveness that we have, we have really tried to provide. Um, and we've spoken, um, you know, to the, I know there have been media questions about this, Councilman Buzzard, and we've spoken with the media to let them know just the facts of what happened um, in that case. Our office responds to roughly between 75 and 100 requests a day for citizenship verification because the first step in any motion in McGirt is to verify that someone's a citizen and we have a lot of tribal citizens. So our offices have been handling, that's just emails, phone calls that come in in different ways, but we provide letters, that, you know, basically just stating that someone is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, Rough, roughly 75 to 100 a day. We have literally run out of space in our server. Uh, we've, we've saved so many documents because with every new criminal case, there comes documents that go along with that evidence, witness statements, police reports, all of those things that the nation has to have and the prosecutors have to review to make a charging decision. And so we literally ran out of space in our server. So we're working with Todd Gore to increase the size of that space. You know, when you're uploading, you know, 30 and 40 gigs, um, of information every couple hours. It doesn't take very long to strain the system. That wasn't something we had thought about in our sovereignty commission, but it quickly became an issue. Um, there have been over 50 McGirt dockets set in the month of March alone. So in the 14 counties, so just in our reservation boundaries, the district court set these McGirt dockets where they hear only cases where people have filed motions to dismiss based on lack of jurisdiction. And we've either attended or we have monitored every one of those 50 um, different cases that have been set in the month of March. We'll find out beforehand, are, are there any Cherokee cases? If there are no Cherokee cases, then we don't need to attend because um, there are some split counties like Wagner where there may be all, all Creek in that particular case. But if there are any Cherokee cases, we've had prosecutors in attendance so that we can hand them the information and the warrant and say, you know, this case has been dismissed and here's the Here's the new information and the new warrant so this person can be transferred over into tribal custody. You know, we have to do a little bit of triage. We prioritize people who are in custody are prioritized uh, because if they're in custody, we presume that there's good reasons for that. And we wanna be sure that those cases are handled first because they tend to be the more serious offenders. Uh, but we're working hard on all the cases that we have. So um, that's just a, a snapshot of what's going on in our office. Um, as we begin to deal with the consequences of, of the decision in Hockner. And as Marshall Buell stated, the, the mandate does not issue until March 31st. And so I expect that the, the rate will only increase after March 31st. I would be remiss if I did not specially highlight the work of the prosecutorial staff um, who've been working incredible hours and doing very good work. Um, Sandy Crossland, Nikki Baker, Jenny Johnson, and Cody Bolin have been the attorneys doing the primary lifting on the criminal jurisdiction side. And our support staff, April McClure, Sally McLemore, Raquel Cocker, and Carrie Fears, Lita Kirk, and Danita Cox are the frontline people that are answering all of the phone calls that we get, checking all the verifications, dealing with, with the day in, day out um, issues that come up from U.S. Attorney's Office, the counties, um, from the Marshal Service, and they're really on the front lines of public safety as much as anyone is. If they don't do their jobs, then we're not able to meet the challenge that our office is facing today. And I'm 
incredibly grateful for their hard work and their dedication. They're a credit to the nation every day that they show up um, and they, they work as hard as any humans can to make sure that, that the issues are being addressed. So like Shannon, I'm sure there will be days when we will make mistakes and I will have to come to you and say, our office made a mistake, but it certainly will not be because um, everyone's not doing everything within their power to ensure a smooth transition and to ensure that public safety um, is always our top priority. So with that, I'll answer any questions that you may have. <clears throat> any questions for our AG? Yes, Councilor Legg. So sir, once after March 31st, and we, let's say we start prosecuting folks, um, where are they gonna go to jail at? Are they gonna go to a federal prison? Are they gonna go to a state prison Then we pay the state? How is this going to work? So right now, they're all held in county, and we're already prosecuting people. So we're not waiting until March 31st to prosecute people. There are already a lot of cases being dismissed by the state courts. Different state judges have looked at it different ways. Some state court judges look at it in terms of, you know, this, the, the court decision said that the Cherokee Reservation has always existed, um, and therefore they need to dismiss those cases now, that the mandate really only applies to that particular case. So we've been getting a lot of cases anyway. Um, when they're in, in custody, they are in one of the, the county jails that we have a contract with, and we're working, we have a, a pretty good list of contracts already, and we're working to expand it so we can cover the entire 14 county area. When they're sentenced to prison terms, which I think is what you're asking me about, when they're sentenced to prison terms, um, there, are, there are federal facilities where those individuals can go. They tend to be, they're, they're the closest federal facility I think is in New Mexico. So they may be able to um, serve that time in the New Mexico prison. That's a long ways from their family and their, their friends. That will pose difficulties for people that are serving longer sentences. Um, and it's possibility that we could enter into contracts with the state. Um, there are also private prisons in Oklahoma. Um, I don't know if it's a possibility that some of them may also be. We don't currently have any contracts for prison detention, so that's something that we will have to work out. Okay. <clears throat> you good, Daryl? Yeah, Councilor Nofar? On, uh, I've talked to several attorneys that are, are dealing with these uh, motion to dismiss cases on clients in different counties. Uh, one of the things that's been handed to them is a questionnaire as if your client is Indian. Uh, they have uh, statutes there uh, in law cases dealing with the United States versus uh, pretenses in that uh, to find a person is to be Indian in the courtroom, one must find factual findings that the person has some Indian blood, and second, that that person is recognized by an Indian tribe of the federal government. It goes on to say that this will come into play within the freedmen who are members of the tribe but have no blood. So far, the Cherokee and I have the, are the only ones that have admitted freedmen's. Therefore, they can stand in tribal court but would not be considered Indian under the Major Crimes Act. An Indian tribal certificate, what includes the degree of Indian blood or membership of that tribe, does not exist members without a certain degree of consistency of Indian blood based off that Pertistis test, which is the law. So is there a gap that the freedmen's might fall in to not fall within that Major Crimes Act uh, since they're not a degree of Indian blood. So I don't think that it's a gap necessarily. It's more of an opportunity for multiple prosecutions. So um, the federal law determines, for purposes of federal criminal law, there are two requirements that they have to be either a citizen of a tribe or they have to have some connection to a tribe. And this is all in case law. It's not in statute. Um, and they have to have some degree of Indian blood in the federal system, that's their requirement. So for, if you file a motion to dismiss, if a freedman citizen files a motion to dismiss and they have no degree of Indian blood, then the, the state court may be able to retain jurisdiction over them. Now under the terms of our own code, which this tribal council's passed, Cherokee Nation exerts criminal jurisdiction over freedmen. It doesn't apply to tribal jurisdiction, it applies to the jurisdiction of the United States and of the state itself. So although I think that this issue will go back up into the federal courts um, on whether on the situation of the freedmen, and I don't believe that Cherokee Nation is the only tribe that admits freedmen. I believe that the Seminole Nation has freedmen citizens as well. Um, but yeah, that's a, it's an issue where there are Cherokee freedmen whose cases may not be dismissed by the state, although the tribe could also prosecute them. So they would be subject possibly to more, the jurisdiction of more entities than, than other people would. Okay, I just found it interesting too that 
that, you know, said they had to have a degree of Indian blood to be the part of the Major Crimes Act, and that's a federal law under the United States court. So this court, this body doesn't seem to want to recognize that by blood statement. So anyways, appreciate it, Speaker. Well, to be okay. clear, you know, the Major Crimes Act doesn't define Indian. It's defined in, statu in, in case law, and most of the cases involving that are extremely old and probably need to be revisited anyway. Oh, oh that, that may be so, but as it currently states, that's, that's the law. That's the, that's the case law that they're referring to, and it's United States case law on by blood references. So, <coughs> Councilor Rio? Yes, on the bail bondsman, will there be very many changes on that, or will they just be dealing with the Cherokee Nation now? So far, we haven't had any issues with bail bondsmen. If they're Oklahoma bail bondsmen and, they are, and they, they're allowed to post bail, that's always been the case in Cherokee Nation. So we haven't had any issues with, you know, bondsmen being unwilling or unable to post bonds for Cherokee Nation um, held um, inmates. So it's not been an issue yet. Okay. Yes, Councilor Buzzer. Uh, Sarah, just a couple of questions. I want to tell you thank you for the job that you guys are doing uh, it's a big job and uh, but I want to ask you on, on courthouses are we looking to contract or get some courthouses all over the 14 county jurisdiction we're definitely looking at some other locations okay. um, it's something that we know as the you know the, for especially for people that live in the northern part of the jurisdiction yeah. it could be you know, it's going to be an issue having access to courthouses, and there are different ways we could potentially deal with that. That's a conversation I've had with the chief and with the chief of staff, and we're, we're actively looking at some locations that we could open up auxiliary courthouses. Okay. The other question, I just uh, <clears throat> want to be clear or be, make it clear to me. In, in criminal cases as far as uh, felonies, will the Cherokee Nation courts be hearing those, those, those type of cases? Yeah. And then federal will probably hear the murder cases and those type of cases. Is that, am I clear on, on that thinking? Yeah, that's right. Uh, the, the, the United States will, uh, when it comes to Indian defendants, the United States will typically handle the murder cases, the most serious felony cases. Okay. There's a list of them that they can, that they can prosecute. But they may also decline some of those that they <laughs> could try and say, well, we don't have time or we're not going to prioritize this particular crime, so we're going to leave that to the nation to prosecute. So we'll go ahead and prosecute those felonies if the feds decline it. Okay. And then uh, the other question is, uh, if they go to the federal courts, there's no, the three-year sentence is not effective there, is it? So That's right. it's only in the Cherokee courts. That's right. The federal okay. sentence, they'll, they'll use their federal sentencing guidelines, which are very specific, yes. and they'll follow those guidelines in federal court. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Anybody else? Councilor Critton. Yes, ma'am. Um, on, on that, what Harley was saying, and I've asked a few times, what, what are we looking at to change the three-year sentencing? Is that, are we looking to do that? Is it even possible? Uh, and I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but I still haven't got that, that uh, clear how we're going to handle those that the U.S., Attorney's office uh, declines to 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 see. Right. How are we going to handle that? Are we are we trying to to change the three year thing, or are we not? Well, I, I think I mean it would require an act of Congress. That's the only way mm -hmm. to change that particular requirement. Um, changing that would be something that would affect, you know, all, it would be a change to the Indian Civil Rights Act. So it would be a change that would affect Indian country throughout the United States. Um, so I'm not saying that it can't be done, but it's going to be a time-consuming process to build consensus behind that and to move that forward in Congress. Okay. And it, I just feel like that's a, I guess that's a pretty big concern, isn't it? The, some of those cases and, um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, mul there's multiple concerns. You know, one exactly. of the concerns is always that, you know, over non-Indians, Cher Cherokee Nation has very little jurisdiction. You know, mm -hmm. there's just a tiny little carve-out under very minimal circumstances can Cherokee Nation exercise jurisdiction over a non-Indian. So there's all of the non-Indians who commit crimes against Indians where neither the state nor the tribe have jurisdiction. That's a huge issue to deal with. Another mm -hmm. issue is in, in the state courts or in the tribal courts, we have this, you know, this hindrance of our own jurisdiction, we, our sentencing ability, not our jurisdiction, but our sentencing ability. And 
both of those are big issues that are going to have to be dealt with, and the only people who can deal with those are Congress. All right, and just to clear my mind to make sure I'm not uh, seeing something funny here, but that's not the first time that people are concerned with the three-year thing, is it? Is, is that a big deal of the conversation? Um, is Do you hear that more often than just fat boy sitting here? <laughs> Um, it's it's been I mean it is an area of concern I think in what I may be looking at it totally I may be looking at it at a different angle but well, you know, I, to me you said the big boys can decline to take a case a murder case right but they could and do you think they probably will or there's a good chance they will or I think on the murder cases I think they'll I mean that ideally I think the 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 this, this scheme generally is, is that the very serious crimes, kidnapping, rape, mm. those kind, murder, that those cases would be picked up by the United States. And therefore, the crimes that the tribe would prosecute would tend to be misdemeanor level offenses or less serious felonies for which a three-year sentence may be appropriate. Okay. But the reality of Indian country prosecution is that the United States rarely lives up to its op full obligation in that regard. So they decline a lot of serious cases, leaving the tribes with... Um, either they and, and they decline cases that are committed by non-Indians, uh, where I have there's nothing I can do to those individuals, or they decline cases against Indians uh, because it's just not a priority to them for whatever reason, and then we are stuck with our three-year statute of limitation or our three-year um, issue that we've got. So in a in a perfect world where the United States fully prosecuted every case that they could it probably is, would be less of a concern, but that has not been the reality of any country law enforcement. Now you, you said we've got 300 new cases or somewhere around there? Is that we filed 375, okay. a little now, over that now. Are all of them the, the kind of the three-year thing, three-year? Um, no, some of them are quite serious. There's more than, there's multiple manslaughter cases and there's a murder two that we filed. Okay, and we're gonna have to try that. Yes, sir. Right? Yes. And all they can get is three years, manslaughter as it is now. Yeah, it's, and it's, it, there's, there's a process called stacking. So you can get three years per offense. So mm -hmm. oftentimes, you know, a murder may involve, they may break <clears throat> into their house. Um, you know, there are multiple crimes that may be occurred in the process, and the murder may be the most egregious of them. We can charge each of those at three years for a max of nine. So nine years total is the maximum that the nation can stack in any circumstance. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for, for that, ma'am. Thank you, Speaker. <coughs> That's good. Good questions. Anybody else? Yes, Councilor Shembaugh. So as far as counties and cities go, um, the cross depths will still be in effect and valid. Yes, so. Sir. Um, if we're talking about a crime that is committed by a non-Indian, will a county or a city still be able to wear uh, the color of that hat that they have always operated under and not and be able to do something against a non-Indian and use their, like, if, if it was a city, uh, could we use our city colors to uh, arrest that non-Indian because we can't do it and I guess it would depend upon the circumstance but if it was against a non-Indian against a non-Indian um, would we be able to use the colors of our jurisdiction to make that arrest yes sir so and if it was a uh, Indian against an Indian um, we would be able to use our cross deputiz deputization to uh, make it arrest there. Correct. So there's only really only one way where we can't do anything, and I'm not going to bring it up, but <laughs> that's the problem. Um, <laughs> gosh, how's that get fixed? I mean, without getting too much into it, other than Congress, I mean, is there any other way? You know, I had had this conversation, um, you know, with with people at the Department of Justice, just bringing this, flagging this issue up, saying we have this, you know, there are these certain circumstances where people need to have these special commissions, which I know that you and I have discussed. There's a couple of different special commissions, making those more easily accessible to local law enforcement because we have such, uh, so many cross, um, 
you know, cross political crimes on the reservation. There's so many Indians and non-Indians living next door to each other in our in our reservation um, that it's important to have that those credentials for local law enforcement. So I've been raising the issue and um, aside from the, an act of Congress, I do not know how else to solve that besides to continue to pressure, you know, BIA to make that a more accessible process and to, to help us help local law enforcement obtain the credentials that they need. I, I don't have a better answer for you than that, Councilman. I wish that I did. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Anybody else? Council No Fire? Just have one question. You may have already covered it. What happens if someone relinquishes their citizenship card in amongst McGirt happening? They just relinquish the being a citizen. They're likely still to be considered an Indian um, because it's not just a question of citizenship, but it's a question of connection to the tribe. So these are all factual determinations that would be made by the court. Right. Um, so the person, even if they've relinquished their citizenship, um, they may be able to go into court and say, I, I relinquished my citizenship, but I have, I am eligible for and have been a member of the, you know, X tribe. I, I go to the Indian hospital for my medical care. Those, those can, types of connections have been considered sufficient to show that they are connected to the tribe and that, and if they also have a quantum of blood, that that's sufficient for the, the Cherokee Nation to exert jurisdiction over them. Okay. All right. Appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, Anybody else? <clears throat> I have a, a question, and you, I know you keep up with legislation on the local level, state level, and national level. Did, uh, you know, being such a historic uh, uh, event for Indian country, our new Secretary of the Interior, Deb Hyland. Did any of our Oklahoma delegation vote for her? They did not. They did not. Not be a better question for a delegate Teehee than me, but it's my understanding that, that none of them did. Okay. All right, just just checking because this was pretty historic for Indian country and uh, Oklahoma meeting the red people and we still don't support our Indian people. So I just wanted to know. It was, Thank a, you very it was much. a very proud moment to see a tribal woman become a sec cabinet secretary of the United States. Incredibly yes. proud moment. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Sarah. I always do a good job. Okay. Next, we have Gwen Terrapin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So far, we've got eight for your request. One of those is outstanding, and everything's been updated on the website, and all of you should have gotten a copy of my report. <clears throat> yes, we did. Any questions for Gwen? Gwen, you do a good job. You've gotten us caught up. So <clears throat> I hear very Thank little you. complaints since you came on board. And that's a Thank beautiful you. blanket. That. Beautiful blanket you got behind you, Star Quill. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Good report. Thank you. Thank you. Tax Commission, Sharon Swepston. Sharon gave good most afternoon. of our money away today. <laughs> we gave a lot away today, so okay. that's a good thing. I believe you do have my report. I'll try to answer any questions that you might have. Any questions for our tax commission? With all that money you gave away, everyone is really pleased. Good. And we just say, uh, uh, you know, I should say that to Gwen and Sarah, happy Women's Month. We're proud of what we have here at Cherokee Nation with all the representatives that we have from our women's. Thank you. Okay. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Next, Gaming Commission, Janice Purcell. Janice Purcell. Speaker, I submitted my report, and if there are any questions, I would welcome them. Okay. Any questions for Janice any Purcell? Questions for Janice Purcell. All right. Also, you did a very good job, so we thank you. Congratulations. Job, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Human Resources, Atlanta Human Castile. Resources, Atlanta Castile. Good afternoon. You have my report. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer those. Any guy, anybody have a Human Resources questions for Atlanta Castile? I think uh, most of these people haven't had enough to eat, and they're just kind of laid back today. But, uh, <laughs> but good report, and we appreciate you, Atlanta. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right, drop down to old business, none pending. We have new business. Um, Mr. Speaker. Yes, ma'am. I would like to request um, that we amend the agenda, moving item number three to ENF. Um, the next committee, I think, is a more appropriate place for that. Second that. 
Second. Okay. Um, you want to do that now? I th move it. I mean, just amend the agenda so we can move it to the next committee. Okay. Usually I wait till I get to that item, but I guess we, we can do it. Do it your it. way. You're leading the meeting. <laughs> okay. Shelly, how do we usually do that? I thought we wait till we got to that item. Okay. All right, we'll do it. We, we can do that. Uh, and it's probably the appropriate place since it's an ENF. It's not a rules issue. So uh, you got a motion and a second first to amend the agenda, correct? Mm hmm Okay. Motion and second to amend the agenda to move item number three to uh, ENF. Any questions, comments? Comment. Yes. Uh, so that's going to take place right after this meeting, right? That will be yes. placed on the agenda. Yeah, just yes. An hour so later. we'll have to vote to amend the agenda to place it on there. Mm -hmm. So is this body going to be willing to vote and approve that on that agenda then? I'm sorry? Is this, but this body has to vote to amend the agenda to allow it on the ENF. I believe so. So is that what's happening here? Is that when we, we vote we, to remove are, it, it automatically places it on the ENF yes, item? Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure that once it votes, we don't have to vote on it again in ENF. To we are voting ENF. to put it on the ENF agenda. Okay. So it'll be on ENF after this. Yes. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Appreciate okay. it. Just again, clarification. <clears throat> Motion and second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Aye. Okay. Got one. Resolution number one. Uh, Councillor Austin, you want to take that? Got a motion and a second. Chair, yes. Okay. Everybody. Everybody, Shelly. Yeah, Ron. <coughs> Ron has been ill, or he would have been here. Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed. Aye. Mayor E. O. Smith, would you take the next one? I yes. Know, I know. He just looks like a mayor. Mayor material to me for some reason. Go ahead, Eo. We got a resolution confirming the reappointment of Anthony Yates as commissioner of the Housing Authority of the Cherokee Nation Board of Commissioners. I put this in the form of a motion. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay. Same here. Yeah. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Okay, so we already did number three. Uh, number four, I'm going to withdraw that when in, in, in replace of that. We're, we're doing a letter with the chief signature, my signature, and Mr. Corey Bunch's signature, the OSSAA. Um, I felt like the students, we abided by the CDC rules at the, at the highest level and just felt like, you know, speaking to some of the parents and concerns when we first pandemic took over, uh, we were the only school in the state of Oklahoma that did not participate in, in athletics or extracurricular activities. said, well, we'll just ask OSSAA and see what they say. So I'm just following through with what I was asked, and so we'll take care of it that way. And just giving you heads up. Yes, Councillor Dobbins. Um, as this resolution, I know you withdrew it, but we're asking for uh, an exception for all students at Sequoia High School. Right, the hardship waiver. Right. Uh, I think the OSSA has always dealt with individual hardships, so you're asking for a, an entire school to get a, a waiver. So this is pre that would be pretty unprecedented mm -hmm. that the OSSA has never granted a whole school a hardship waiver. But isn't the intent, though, is to allow those students that felt like they needed to, to play sports go elsewhere, and now we want to provide a means for them to come back? If they choose of, to. So you're asking them for a second hardship waiver for those individual students. And Correct. in the past, they've never offered a second hardship waiver. And they we've never had one. a pandemic here at yeah, Cherokee no, Nation. I'm just, what we're asking is somewhat unprecedented. Right. I hope, it, I hope we can achieve it, but it is pretty much unprecedented. Right. Thank you, Speaker. Okay. Yes, Councillor Critton. Yes, sir. Now, Speaker, this is just, is, is this going to say council or just the Speaker? It's going to say, Speaker, I'm going to sign off on it. Okay. Chief signature, my signature, Corey Bunch's signature. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? And that's a good point, Councillor Dobbins, on the uh, hardship. So, you know, we'll just see how it goes. And, 
you know, we, we, we complied with, with what they wanted us to do. And this is uh, unprecedented, but, you know, the pandemic was unprecedented. Yes, Council. I'm Department. sorry, I must have had an earwax or something in my ear. What, what were we pulling it back for and not passing it today? What were we pulling it off the table for? Well, we, I'm going to try to stay in compliance with OSSAA guidelines. Right. There's some really strict guidelines there mm. on, on the government. We're the government. Right. And so that's why I think we need to just take it from, from uh, the Department of Education, which would be Corey Bunch's signature. Right my signature individually, and then uh, the chief's signature. We're going to do it that way okay. and see what kind of response we get. That's doesn't good. mean we well, stop there if they say no. Yeah. It doesn't mean we quit there. Right, yeah. I'm There's other avenues. Whatever is the proper method, and you guys know that you guys have been yeah. in conversation. I trust you and Corey mm -hmm. and the leadership on that. So. Well, I had Stacy Leeds write this up, and she covered really all the bases that I wanted her to cover, and, and I wanted her to keep me in compliance and keep me legal, So, and I trust her. Okay. All right. I'm just giving you an update on that. Uh, last resolution. Uh, Councillor Duncan, you want to take that? Yes, sir. And I would also um, like, to, like to say that we handed out an amended version. Everybody has changing the name. Mm -hmm. um, and there actually needs to be one change to this amended version that was handed out. Um, it, what we're doing here is um, the Wilma P. Mankiller Water Act. Um, and we're going we're gonna to go ahead and uh, ask that we would change the name to the Wilma P. Mankiller and Charlie Soap Water Act, um, alternative, alternatively the Mankiller Soap Water Act. Um, and so that, the ones that were handed out, it also needs to be changed in the title of the act. It still says Wilma P. So um, those changes, um, and I put that in the form of a motion. In discussion? Yes. Councilor Taylor. I just want to say one thing, and I had expressed this to administration. One of the biggest headaches that I have is the individual water and sewer. When constituents are building a new house, they cannot apply for that help from Cherokee Nation until they start their house. And I have had more than one citizen get to the point where all they lack is the water, they need to close on their loan, but because of the way we do our applications, They've been approved, but they haven't, um, Cherokee Nation hasn't released the funds. And I ask that there be some type of mechanism to forward fund that at the beginning of the year so that the citizens would have it when they're ready to do their water part of it. And I just want to go on record that I did ask for that, and I would like for some mechanism be included. Okay, no, very well. Nobody that, Shelley? Okay. All right. Uh, Councillor Duncan. Uh, yes. I also wanted to add um, for, for Councillor Crittenden and myself, uh, rural water districts are one of our, uh, our biggest areas of need in Adair County. Um, uh, and, and I know a lot of you guys have access to good water and then uh, some don't in your districts as well. And um, it's, I, I'm just kind of taken back because we, uh, we just uh, voted on, on a, a piece of legislation that's going to allow health centers, um, health and wellness centers throughout the nation, drug treatment abuse centers, which I thought was, I mean, the mecca of all deals. And then we come out with this, which is may even top it. It's one of the best pieces of legislation that, that we've, we've gotten to pass since at least whenever I've been on council. But this is going to, um, there's so many people in, in Ader County alone, and I know other areas that are suffering because of rural water districts. And I'm not putting the blame on the rural water districts, but um, it, it's just infrastructural problems. And um, this, is, this is going to address that. And, and I'm just proud to introduce it, and I'm proud to vote for it today. Yes, Councilor Crittenden. Yeah, thank you, Speaker. Um, I just, uh, this right here is a, a big deal, a big deal. And we all get our separate amount of phone calls per day, and we all have constituents. Um, I just, there's been a problem for a long time with, with uh, getting water 
water pipes. These things are old. The bills. And uh, this affects so many Cherokee people. And, and it's been... And there's some there's some negativity out there in the in the world, especially on the old the old Facebook wizardry. But but I want to tell you that uh, that this is a prime example of Cherokee people's needs, basic, essential needs, getting met. And I don't know very many adjectives or anything, but this deal is big for for our area and other areas. So mm -hmm. just thank you for, and I know everybody's going to pass this thing, so thank you for doing that. Thank you to administration for, for listening to the people. And um, there you go. So Speaker, you. I, and since he said that too, I, want, I failed to mention that. I do want to thank the administration because they they um, they came to us with this plan, as they did with the wellness centers, um, and this is just simply helping Cherokees. and And I I applaud the administration for bringing this to us. Earlier, as we had lunch, that lady you guys know that was eating with us there, uh, she's in her middle seventies. Her average water bill was fifty fifty dollars. Fifty dollars from Eight Air County. That's a lot of money for a seventy-year-old lady to to have a bill that high. Uh, and she says, "Yeah." And and then she says, "When they went to go, when they go to pay for their bill, you don't see real people. So there's a little slot there where you go and put in your 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 payment. You don't get talked to real people." He said, "They take our money, but if we have a complaint, we don't know where to go." <laughs> I said, "That sounds like back in the." 60s before we were recognized. Uh, yes, Harley Buzzard. Yes, yes. I want to. I want to just uh, echo the talk that uh, the counselors have talked about this water legislation. It's probably a, a legislation that I've been I dealt dealing with for the last 20, 25 years at the Cherokee Nation, and we have always uh, tried to get more money to put in that because you simply do don't get enough money from Indian Health Service to run these programs. The water lines have gone up probably five times since I went back there in 1980 when I started. So this bill is going to help a lot of people. The good thing about uh, the Cherokee Nation and, and putting water lines and roads into our communities is that it benefits not only the Cherokees, but it benefits the public people out there. So it's going to benefit everybody, not, not just Cherokees, but it's going to benefit everybody that lives in that community. So that's a good thing. Uh, we have asked for money in the past, and, and the administrations in the past have given us some money, but it's never enough money to cover what we need to get done out there. So this is this is huge. This is a huge act that we're going to hopefully pass today, and I'm, I'm sure it will pass. The other thing that I just want to address to uh, Councillor uh, Taylor is, uh, is that's been a problem, you know, for quite some time about uh, new construction. Uh, that's a policy of the Water and Sanitation Department, and and I think you're probably right. Uh, Billy Hicks and uh, Michael M. probably need to take a look at that policy because I too get calls of people that's doing new construction and they're within weeks of getting uh, their house completed and they need that water and need the sewer. So I'm sure that they can go back and look at that. And, and I'll tell you the reason that was put in, put in place. It was put in place when I was over in the program is when I was there, and I hate to say this, but I will, I'll tell you why. A lot of people would apply for new construction. We would approve them. We would go out and drill a well. Back then, we were waiting until they had the foundation dug and put in place. We go back six months later, and there was no house there. So that was the reason we moved the timeline up on that. But 90% but completion is probably a little, little too long to wait to get your services in because a lot of loans are tied back to to water and sewer on those properties. So I'm sure uh, uh, Billy Hicks and then Michael Lynn will take a look at that to, to rectify that situation. So that's where that come from. We've had that in place probably for 30 years here, and, but it does, it does need to change. So I, I appreciate you bringing it up, uh, Councilor Taylor. So I'm sure they'll take note of that. Thank you, Chair. 
Councilor Taylor and Councilor Buzzard and rest committee, we'll just we'll get with the chief of staff. Let's see if we need to do some type of legislation, coordinate it with Michael Lynn and make it happen. Just a little bit of communication there. Yes. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, I was going to suggest that uh, Michael Lynn's here to answer any questions that you guys may have, and we can definitely talk about that and see if we can make a revision to that policy. To, um, Counselor, I know that uh, I've had several uh, people I've known that I've qu have asked questions about that, and it was a barrier to some of their um, documents and closing out their loans and getting their house completed. Uh, but definitely we can take a look at that. But I would suggest that maybe we hear from Michael Lynn. And then um, today's kind of a special day for this and the fact that you uh, have offered an amendment on the floor to recognize Charlie Soap, who is a friend to many of us. And uh, today is Charlie's birthday. And so it's a very special day from that aspect as well. So I'd like to say happy birthday to Charlie Soap as well. So, Speaker, if you, if you guys would yield a little bit of time to Michael Lynn to answer a few questions. And okay. We have a motion and a second, right, on the floor? Okay. Any, any questions for, uh, yes, Councilor Nofire? All right. I think it's a great name. Glad we got Charlie Soap added on there. Uh, <laughs> great guy. These they 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 hats are off to them. I think they even made you know, they made the, the the movie about their efforts, and this bill kind of reflects a little bit of that. Um, great headline. But when I get into it, majority of it's just a lot of policy stuff that could already have fallen underneath the the administrative authority to go look at some of the problems that we have. And I know that. I mean, I've got with Councillor Crittenton and Councillor Duncan, and they, they have, I mean, they work tirelessly on dealing with their water issues, especially over in Cherokee World mm -hmm. Water District. Um, I really see the Legislative Act only re needing to get passed is for the $2 million uh, appropriations that this council is going to agree to after the uh, fiscal year 2022, I believe, that we're going to start adding $2 million above what our fiscal year for 2021, which was this year, so we're adding $2 million to the following budget year that will come up. Um, is that going to be enough money? I, mean, I think they could probably spend $2 million just in Cherry Tree, probably going through there, whacking around, figuring out where's the problem at, and, and connections with those rural water districts. Um, it's going to go beyond that. So for me, uh, asking you about more, more money that you guys might need to build additional... Uh, solutions to some of the problems that we have you know it could just be as simple as creating some new policy changes like councillor taylor and councillor buzzard have have attest to needing to be changed and then coming back to us after you recognize okay you need 1.2 million dollars in cherry tree they don't have the funds for it uh, do we i mean I'm, I'm i like the idea i like the name of the act and everything i just don't feel like the act was necessary to go study the problem and then come back to the council and say here's what we found Here's what we need appropriated budget modifications for to fix all these problems, to take care of our citizens, and, and, and go from there. So I just was going to refer to you and see, I mean, I'm sure you know problems. You, you, you've seen it already. What is that going to take to fix them? Mr. Speaker, if I may, uh, the, yes, go ahead. The, the, the comprehensive study of this Cherry Tree Rural, Rural Water District is already underway. Right. Uh, we've, we've hired a, uh, an engineering firm, an independent engineering firm, uh, to prepare a, uh, an engineering study uh, to come back with recommendations uh, and solutions and cost estimates. Uh, that is nearing its completion. Uh, we have a draft document in our hand. Uh, I do believe it's been passed recently by the Cherry Tree Board, Water Board, uh, and it's back in the uh, engineer's hands to make any final changes or revisions and then get a f an official sign-off on it. Uh, once we have that, uh, again, it's referred to in this act, uh, as a as a as a to-do item, uh, but I want to let everybody know that it already has been started and it is nearing completion. Right. Okay. Great. Great. I mean, I just I think it's great. I think it's a great headline of an act. I just didn't necessarily see it as a reason to happen because we're working on these things. It sounds like the chief and the staff have already started getting that ball rolling, and now we need to see where we go to and say, okay, this two million that we're doing, that's good that we're we're already looking he ahead of what we need, but it sounds like we're going to probably need more and, and go from there. So, but uh, I'm glad you're here for some questions and stuff like that. So, but I appreciate it, Speaker. Thank you. I hear you. Did you still have a question? Crittenden? No, I just going to say that passed it. We'll look at it. We'll look at it some more later. There's some people need some help with this water issue, and we need to come 
back and ask for more money. By golly, we will. Let's pass this thing. I'm ready. Anybody else? Yes. I just Council want to make Tatum. one comment, and that is that a lot of the grant opportunities that are out there, and Councilor Legg can attest to this, look at what have you done on your own to make this happen for your people. And this is something that we can point to and say, our council was behind it, our administration was behind it. We started our own study, and it makes grant opportunities available once you put the ball in motion. Mm -hmm. Totally agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing about being sovereign nation, and we want to be sovereign. You can't cherry pick the parts of sovereign you want to be. You got to take everything on with that. You're talking about water for your people. You're talking about law enforcement. It, there's a whole there's a whole thing that you got to take on when you want to be sovereign. You just can't cherry pick the good things. So that comes with the territory. All right. We got a motion. We got a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, ayes have it. Okay, that about wraps up our, our agenda, right? Any announcements to my right? Yes, Councillor Dobbins. Uh, speaker, you said the raise the possibility of having April council in back in chambers? Yes. Will that mean also in-person committee reports starting in April as well? We haven't decided that yet, but uh, we're, we are looking at April so far. I've got with Shelley and Gail, we're looking at being back in the chambers in April. Very good. Playing it day by day. Okay, thanks, Speaker. Councilor Vasquez. Will that include letting anyone in the audience or not? Not yet. I didn't think so. Thanks. Okay, anybody else? Anybody got a woman in, in, in your life that you'd like to recognize? This is Woman's Month here. We got about 10 minutes here. Okay. Nobody here? Nobody yeah, here? Okay. Yeah, I have a wife I'd like to recognize. Okay. Yes, you better. <laughs> I, I have four sisters that I want to recognize. One was the first uh, Cherokee speaker to graduate out of Sequoia County. The, the second was the first Cherokee speaker to make all state in basketball. Then my third was another Cherokee speaker, all state in basketball. I'm saying it because it's March Madness. And, and, and the last one is she's just the nurse at Redbird. Proud of all the ladies in my family. They, they, they do rule our household. Okay. You better, can you? I know. Besides, I mean, of course, my wife yes. and, and, and mother, grandmother, mm -hmm. but also one that I got to see today for the first time in a long time, Fan Robertson. Yes. She's always been a, a constant uh, person that I could look to for advice, and uh, she's just a good lady. I was, I was proud to see Fan, and she's a good, strong woman, and um, I'm glad her picture's up on that, with, with your family's picture over there at Fort, Fort Smith on, the, on, on that mural. On that mural. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know how we work that out. Yo. Yeah. Okay, Rex. Rex, he knows where, he knows who's the, <laughs> West? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm obviously, I've come with, uh, you know, I've got two older sisters that helped mold me to hopefully be, be a good husband to my wife. And I think her, I think my two kids, um, you know, my mom who, who lived a life of mental health, and that's why it was, it was a big deal for the mental health bill to be passed. Um, you know, she lost her life to suicide. But really, what, what's inter actually interesting, I want to bring forward a, a Cherokee that uh, my great aunt, Anna Kilpatrick, she was Durban Feeling's first linguistic teacher at NSU. And so that kind of set the, our families together and, and the culture and our language. And so that was kind of a pretty unique thing for me and my family. So appreciate sure. it, Speaker. Yeah. Councilor Legg, you already stood up and did your pledge. I got three fiery redheads that kind of run our, run our household. And I just, uh, I'm a blessed man. That's all I can say, Speaker. There I'm a go. blessed man to have them. Councilor Deer. I ain't got nobody. <laughs> my wife, of course, um, Aunt Ramona Mason that had passed, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the strong Cherokee women that are present here. Mm -hmm. So that's all I got. Yeah. Councilor Crittenden. Yeah, I got a good good wife from Henrietta, Christina. She's a good one. Um, got three daughters, Lacey, Jenna, Sammy, and my mother. I'm blessed to still have my mother, uh, Debbie. Holloway Crittenden, uh, half Cherokee, good lady, good cook, has been good to me. So, 
Thank you for that opportunity to recognize yes. those folks. Got right. a good sister too. She yes. got been good to me. Got a couple of lake houses, so I better mention my sister. <laughs> she she gives me the keys to the. But uh, thank you. Yes, Councilor Austin. Well, I think we would be remiss to not recognize the uh, the ladies who uh, serve alongside us on council. Uh, not only today, but historically. We've had, if we look at the photos on the wall, we'll see many, many ladies have, uh, have served here and uh, uh, proud to uh, serve with every one of them and uh, thank them for that. Also uh, proud to uh, uh, have a great Cherokee mother, a great Cherokee wife, a uh, great Cherokee daughter and daughter-in-law that are all uh, part of my family and uh, uh, keeping, keeping the uh, traditions alive. Okay. Applause to all the Cherokee women. They're just pretty good host. All right, now I need a motion to adjourn. Motion. Aguiosa.